I'd like to introduce uh, Greg Mackey. Cutting his teeth as a cabaret musician and department store executive, Greg co-founded and was managing director of Adelaide's iconic imprints bookstores, booksellers. With a wealth of government experience, including a term as an elected member of the Adelaide City Council and on the boards of many community benefit arts and cultural organizations, he was a founder of the Adelaide Festival Ideas. Greg went on to head up ArtSA, becoming Deputy Chief Executive and Department of Premier and Cabinet, where he was, his stewardship included ArtSA, the Adelaide Thinkers in Residence Program, the Capital City Directorate, and establishment of the Integrated Design Commission SA. In 2012, Greg moved to SA Health to head up the Office of Aging. The following three years consulting, Greg joined the History Trust of South Australia as CEO in 2016. Welcome, Greg. Thanks very much. Uh, um, and I was going to say good morning, but it's actually afternoon now, so um, time is fluid. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to start with a slight variation on the um, observation that everybody has made at the beginning uh, to recognise that we're, we're gathering on the um, traditional lands of the Ghana people and just share with you uh, the, the extract of our History Trust of South Australia acknowledgement of um, First Nations peoples. The History Trust of South Australia respects the primary place of Aboriginal people in the history of this place. We acknowledge that this story commenced long before Governor Highmarsh proclaimed the new province of South Australia on the 28th of December 1836. Aboriginal people have a history that extends millennia into the past. We acknowledge that Aboriginal lands and sovereignty were not recognised and that building a shared understanding of history is critical to reconciliation and we affirm our role in reconciliation as an essential part of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal South Australians co-creating a positive future. Um, the reason I, I just wanted to share that with you was to uh, make the point or echo, re reinforce the point that all, all tradition is invented. 25 years ago, there was rarely a gathering of people in South Australia where First Nations people uh, would have been acknowledged. Um, and in fact, 25 years ago, the term First Nations didn't exist. And you will now start to see that working its way into public language and replacing uh, Indigenous, and which ultimately actually also replaced uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, which was a rather large mouthful. The journey continues. Um, culture is fluid. Uh, we, uh, in my role at the History Trust, I, 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 uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm the keeper of. I am. I have a stewardship role as a keeper of stories about South Australia, and uh, uh, that, in fact, is actually not all that much different to uh, stuff that I've done um, over the last 20 years. Um, mention was made of the Adelaide Festival of Ideas. That was a. I was a small business operator but it was a civil society response to a gap in a marketplace, which was about how we celebrate the exchange of ideas, the role of discourse, uh, debate in, in, in a civilised society. And, um, and it was probably something that one, no one university themselves could have initiated and managed to get the other universities on side. No one tier of government could have initiated, but kind of I just wangled my way through and found actually very, very quickly some very sympathetic ears. The then Minister for the Arts, Diana Laidlaw, in, in the, uh, uh, the Liberal Government of the 1990s, uh, the uh, uh, Lord Mayor of Adelaide at the time, Jane Lomax-Smith, two conversations and suddenly I had $150,000 to start to work with. Um, and so that was something that was able to be done outside of bureaucracy, but it actually then led to a whole lot of opportunities and a whole lot of collaborations within and beyond uh, bureaucracy. Um, the, 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 uh, as, as a public servant, as a, as a leader in a public sector organisation, I know most of you who are in similar roles know or appreciate wherever you are in the organisational hierarchy that there's kind of three golden rule books uh, in, uh, the, in the South Australian public sector. There's Treasurer's Instructions, there's DPC Circulars, and the Code of Ethical Behaviour. Beyond that, there's hundreds and hundreds, thousands of policies and rules. But the gaps in between is where all the wriggle room is, and it is in that wriggle room that 
innovation can occur. It is in that wriggle room and that taking of licence that um, uh, new ways can be found. Um, we, you know, we all love the... We were talking earlier about um, uh, utopia, but I also rem remember always with affection uh, Little Britain and you know the person who comes into the public service office and the counter is a, a woman with a keyboard and they ask a question, the computer says no. And, and you know, we, we all have experienced that as, as citizens uh, and, and probably at times we've had to be the, the bearer of the no message. The, the, my take outs from the last 20 years of involvement um, in and around public administration and the leadership of public administration can probably be, be sort of summed up in, in four pairings or singularities of words. A belief in the dignity of service, understanding the nature of agency and trust, a sense of urgency and an unbridled uh, vast reserves of optimism and resilience. Um, now I'll, I'll just very quickly um, expand on, on, on each of those. Uh, mention was made in, my, in the introduction that uh, I started life as a cabaret musician and as a department store um, uh, executive. So I was a merchant um, and that went on uh, with my journey into, uh, into book selling. Um, I learned very, very quickly that you have to believe in the value of what you are contributing. And whether it's a counter, over-the-counter transaction, a belief in the dignity of service, not an attitude of self-entitlement. Sometimes you have to deal with other people's attitudes of self-entitlement, but it, it um, has stuck with me and it, it has served me very well and it serves many, many of us uh, very well to believe in that dignity of service. To understanding the operational context in which you are trying to deliver services, achieve change, develop policy, um, requires a, a, a good understanding of, in effect, a kind of mapping of the, the nature of agency within your organisation. And by agency, I mean where the permissions come from and how you seek permission or how you work around the absence of, of permission. And sometimes the absence of permission is where things exciting things can happen because if you haven't asked and therefore been told no, you can just have a go. Um, and uh, I'm reminded Warren McCann, who many of us will remember, uh, a previous uh, Chief Executive of Premier and Cabinet, he was there when I went in uh, uh, to my first role as Executive Director at, at Arts SA. And I walked into his office after one week and said, oh, Warren, I've got this real problem, blah, 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 it's going to cost $40,000 to fix and I don't have any money. And he said, well, Greg, you have got a problem and I, I strongly encourage you to go away and figure out how to solve that problem and come back and, and see me when you've solved the problem and tell me how you did it. And I walked out thinking, you f***ing prick. Um, uh, you know, that was no help to me whatsoever. But actually, later I came to thank him for it because, I mean, I just didn't know my way around the public sector. I didn't, I didn't understand processes. But everybody was willing to uh, extend the hand and, and, and try and help. And so I did solve that problem and went on and, and have done, as we all do, um, solving many problems, sometimes multiple simultaneously. The, um, the other piece of advice Warren gave me at some point, I think by this stage I was deputy chief in premiers and Warren had moved on, uh, but the, an edict had been issued, that was just before an election and Christmas before, I don't know, the 2010 election, and um, the rule was sent out that there would be no taxpayer money spent on Christmas parties. And I just thought, that's outrageous. We are a taxpayer, the public sector is an employer. And uh, we had planned a Christmas party for Premier and Cabinet. It was a pretty fine Christmas party, as I recall. Um, and um, uh, Warren turns up with his partner and we're dancing away on the dance floor. And I sidled up to him and said, oh, hey, Warren, thanks for coming. I, um, uh, I have a little admission to make, you know, that, that uh, edict you issued about um, not to, uh, uh, no taxpayer money going into Christmas parties. Well, I said, I've broken that a little bit. And he said, good, Greg, some rules are meant to be broken. And that was a bit of a revelation to me. That Don't quote me on it, but um, it was a, a bit of a, of a, of a revelation. Um, so uh, I think 
um, Jim Wally talked about the relationship and others uh, to your political masters, to our political masters, and understanding that any change requires an investment of, of political capital, whether it's your professional administrative political capital or ultimately that of your minister. And so having, having the, the trust and respect and confidence of your minister or your chief executive uh, um, is absolutely vital. Um, sense of urgency, that was another lesson that I brought with me from retail into uh, public administration. Of course, I'm no paragon of virtue. Um, there are many things, worthy and important things, that I've managed to slide uh, out in the hands of time quite successfully over the years, but, but for reason. But actually, to approach uh, your role with a sense of urgency, to understand and appreciate that what we are metering out um, as public sector leaders are portions of time, uh, and every portion of time has a price. It has also a value. And we have, uh, we squander time, and yet it is our most precious resource. Um, the number of, of meetings that uh, our, our organisational cultures uh, um, mandate, uh, or, or at least um, allow, uh, um, or don't discourage, um, can be a, a chronic waste of time. Understanding what is the nature of the meeting, who needs to be there. I, I did have the opportunity of spending about six months as acting chief executive in Premier and Cabinet uh, on two occasions uh, between chief executives and uh, as the, the temporary head of the senior management council I tried to make a, a golden rule of finishing the meeting in three quarters of the time that was allocated so that every one of those highly paid chief executives could walk away having harvested 15 minutes. Now, whether they just went and had a coffee or, or not is, 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 is immaterial. Coming to appreciate the value of time as the most precious resource, we get hung up about the lack of working capital to deliver on projects. And of course, you know, that's, that, that is a reality. Uh, all too often we forget that actually the officer time uh, is an incredibly value, valuable and precious resource that, that, we, that, we, that we squander. Um, so that's the, the touch point on sense of urgency. Optimism and resilience, well, uh, it's, it is self-explanatory. Um, if uh, we all got consumed by the, the limits uh, of um, capacity, uh, the limits of, of funding, uh, we might as well just pack up and, and go home. So, keeping an eye on the glass half full rather than uh, getting consumed by the glass half empty uh, has certainly been something that served me and others uh, uh, who I have admired and respected uh, quite well. And of course, just the resilience to, to understand um, that sometimes things uh, can't go where, where they're meant to. Finally, um, I, I want to acknowledge that some of the change I've had uh, I've been party to trying to introduce over the years that hasn't stuck um, has in fact been a result of a failure to understand the psychological journey of change that you're trying to, that we've been trying to make. I, I did have the um, Adelaide Thinkers in Residence program uh, within my Ballywick for uh, about five years and that was an amazing program and many people here have participated uh, um, uh, in it over over the years that it that it existed, what what it what it um, tried to do at times as an agent as a tool of change for the the then premier uh, was uh, very quickly undone uh, subsequently because of whether it's you know passive resistance or structured resistance political op opposition uh, from from political competitors. There are a range of, of things. The best change, sometimes the best change is short and short-lived, but, but also at other times the best change is actually change that can endure. Um, and if we had the, the reflection, the time to reflect and to invest in some sense of the psychological journey of change that we were endeavouring to undertake, um, some of some of what did prove to be short-lived might have been uh, proven to be longer-lived. Um, I'm going to I'm going to wrap there and uh, look forward to being part of the panel. Thanks for listening.